how, how have community organizations' resources responded? Meaning, can they manage what I assume is an increase in referrals? And are they receptive to these SDOH programs? And following Rose and Mike, I'm, you know, plant a little seed for Steve about, you know, when you're thinking more broadly about these companies and products and services, what are your expectations of, you know, what their response is going to be when they're not really explicitly focused on health? Do you have any thoughts about uh, some of the work you're doing with Building H and what, you, what kind of response you expect? But uh, Rose and Mike, either one of you want to go first on the, how the response from the community? I'll go ahead and defer to Rose. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot this year and we definitely kind of tapped out a lot of our usual resources. Fortunately, I think, um, you know, organizations responded appropriately by trying to garner as many extra bodies and resources that they could bolster their programs with. Um, but we do have capacity issues and that definitely does affect us. It is also part of why our patient navigators are pretty, pretty good at going in and updating our referral system to say, this is a responsive resource. This is a very helpful resource so that, you know, as we, as we approach capacity with some of our referral partners, we, we can kind of like deprioritize them on the list and try to send an influx of referrals to a new site. Great. Thanks. And Steve, do you have any thoughts just from thinking even a little more wide, broader about that type of question yeah. and what you're working on? You know, it's an interesting question because I think a lot of the companies that, that sort of are involved in our, our daily lives, you know, whether that's Apple, Google, Netflix, you know, Lyft, Uber, uh, DoorDash, you know, um, you know, historically, nobody's ever sort of said you're, it's important that you look out for the health of your, your, your customers. Um, but some of them, you know, I think are making moves in, in that direction. And, and part of what we're trying to do is to sort of set up a a conversation that, that really even just starts with a baseline of saying, well, let's look at the impact uh, of your services on different behaviors. So we have sort of a framework that looks at things like, is it helping people eat more healthy or less? You know, uh, does it help people get more physical activity? Um, uh, are you interfering with people's sleep or are you facilitating that in some way? Do you help you, are you building social connection? Um, and are you helping people get outdoors? Because that's something that, that's increasingly seen as something valuable for us. So even just asking the question and having them start to look at their, their, you know, their products critically um, and then ask sort of how can we, we tweak them in a direction that's positive in those dimensions? You know, you look, you look at a company, um, you know, like Netflix or Hulu or something, and you said, look, TV watching is generally not going to be a super healthy activity. I mean, that's just sort of the reality of it, but are there ways that they can make moves that would make it a sort of healthier version of what it is um, while still being the, the entertainment product, you know, that it ought to be and that, that, that we all value. Um, you know, I'll give a really simple example of, of, I think where Apple and Google have done some, some good work is, is around the idea of sleep um, where they, they have both in, in both Android and I, iOS have said, you know, bedtime's a real thing. Um, it's a different time of the day for our users than, than other times of the day. And we want to respect that. We want to give them the ability to control that, to tell us when they want to go to bed. And then we'll figure out how to sort of not demand as much attention of them and distract them as much at that time. And, and I think that idea of honoring the user's intention is really important. Um, but I think even just starting from, from asking the question, you know, sort of how do we do this product in a way that has positive impacts you know, across a number of behaviors. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a great place to start and that's the kind of engagement that we're looking to see. Great. And as all of you were speaking, uh, you know, the big question in my mind just popped up as I was listening is um, maybe giving us, if you could shed some light on how COVID you know, obviously has, is driving demand for these types of services, but at the same time, a lot of hospitals are uh, facing severe financial pressures. And so what do you see, how do you see this playing out in the marketplace for that, you know, the vendors providing these services? Are you seeing an uptick in adoption or are the financial pressures causing some uh, hospitals to um, rein things in a little bit? Um, what, are, what are you seeing in, in the market? If, uh, Mike or Rose, you wanna jump in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at it first. Um, you know, <laughs> 
without patting Chilmark too much on the back, I, I at one point said uh, that your report felt as if somebody was a fly on the wall of, you know, recording uh, conversations that we were having as it relates to market opportunities and uh, solutions like the vendors that you have listed in your appendices of that report. Um, no doubt COVID has accelerated uh, the adoption of these types of technologies uh, driven in part by, um, you know, embracing telehealth first uh, in some, some ways as a result of the inability to provide care uh, in person as a result of the pandemic uh, and, and its limiting factors. Uh, and therefore, while telehealth already existed, I think the increase um, in its utilization as a result of uh, allowing for funding and providers to deliver care in that way in the absence of, of traditional alternatives um, started to make people not only more comfortable with that use of technology, but for those that may have been naysayers around it, uh, there was uh, increased uh, engagement as they discovered it, it really, you know, some of the myths maybe they had in their mind about it weren't true. It helped with certain populations, the elderly, et cetera, that might not need to be burdened to always come into the office. So uh, as a result, uh, you know, looking more at what in the brain health care we've traditionally referred to as Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs and care, um, the social determinants of health seems to be a lot of focus right now and, and looking further upstream, I think, has resulted from, um, you know, from really realizing that uh, if you're not receiving care in the hospital, but people's health is still uh, exacerbated or becoming worse, uh, pandemic or no pandemic. Uh, there are certainly factors that are social and in, in, uh, in nature that need to be addressed. So these these IT solutions provide some interesting new ways to grab the data that can can drive direction for organizations. Okay, thanks, Rose. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I think we're in a little bit of a different space than a lot of hospitals because social determinants have been a focus for quite some time at BMC. Um, so instead of engaging with an IT solution. You know, we, we've had our Aunt Bertha platform for a couple of years now. It was more about how do we shift our workflows and processes to make sure that our, we are identifying patient needs. Um, previously, patients only got screened when they came into clinics. So when we knocked down our in-person visits to like 15%, we weren't screening our patients. So we had to kind of flip the switch to think about how do we make sure we are still actively screening our patients, making sure we're connecting them to resources, and also how do we do that without hiring anyone? Um, so we kind of had to reimagine our patient navigator role a little bit, and we also recruited a whole bunch of medical students to get involved to do some proactive outreach to touch base with patients, see how they're doing, see if they needed anything, and then make a referral. Well, on this note, that leads to one of the questions we have in our, our chat or Q&A section here is that uh, there's somebody who'd like to have, uh, you know, more explication of linking out from Epic for the referrals and what that sort of, you know, movie, how you engage, I guess, with the provider and then out to the, um, uh, to the patient actually accessing care. If, if, do you want to maybe dive into that a little deeper so the uh, clear understanding sure. of the process? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a wonky process. Um, we don't bypass the provider, but we, well, we kind of do a little bit, but we definitely don't ignore them from this. So the providers are not the one actually doing the screenings, but we have a member of our clinical team. So like I said, in my clinic, it's the medical assistants who perform the screening and enter it. And then the provider is able to see the results as a part of their visit workflow. And like I said, if they screen positive for anything, it does drop an ICD-10 code that they have to either approve or remove from the visit encounter. So that's kind of how the physician or the nurse practitioner provider gets involved in it. Um, in terms of actual referral, that's where we rely on the patient navigator. So because providers only have 20 minutes to do a visit, obviously social needs are a large part of what many patients need addressed. We wanted the providers to have that 20 minutes to take care of their their physical health needs, and then we have someone outside of the visit help them with their social needs. So if they screen that I need help with my housing, here's the number for the Boston Housing Authority here, you know, we'll get you a letter if you need your utility support. 
Um, so the patient navigator actually does the physical connection and then they document each of those referrals and epics. So if you look at that snapshot, you can say, oh, my patient screened positive for needing housing support and my patient navigator referred them to XYZ to help them. Great. So it's, it's a little bit disparate, but so far it's working okay. It's working. And Mike, with uh, brain care, your, any differences from that type of process or anything else you'd like to add? Uh, you yeah, know, we don't, we don't use Epic and our, um, our IT system is not tied in to <clears> use <throat> of the Access Me Care platform, which also, you know, I should state is in its very early stages of implementation here uh, in, in Iowa. Um, the processes, however, that are uh, currently being uh, put in place uh, seem to be, be pretty smooth and uh, there's good... Uh, engagement around community partners as well as end users. So we're, we're very positive uh, in our early kickoff experience um, to date. And I'm familiar with uh, that particular platform uh, in other states like North Carolina and uh, Virginia and Georgia, Oklahoma, where it has multiple uh, use cases with other community-based organizations ranging from uh, EMS to uh, FQHCs and telehealth uh, providers. Um, but uh, our, our experience is a little bit different than Rose is uh, describing since uh, we're, we're not using it in tandem in the same way that she's describing Epic and uh, Aunt Bertha working, uh, working together. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and here's an interesting question about what are the biggest barriers to, to scaling interventions and programs that address social determinants of health? And maybe since we haven't heard from Steve for a while, maybe we'll begin with you just from your broader perspective. And, and you know, we had an earlier conversation about that whole, you know, every social determinants of health paper typically begins with that graphic showing genetics is this much, medical care is that much. And I know you have some issues with that way of thinking and the, how, you know, the, the linearity between different determinants and ultimate outcomes is not as that, that, that type of graphic would imply. So that might come into play here and how we think about even, you know, the notion of scale or ROI and so forth and how complex that can be. So maybe begin with you and then the others can sure. drill down their respective Yeah, I, and I think what I was getting at is that, um, you know, these things are dynamic, they're intertwined. I mean, they, I think sort of behavior and social socioeconomic circumstances, it, it's not like they, they, they exist on separate planets. You know, one very much influences the other. So to sort of divide it up and say, well, this much is socioeconomic factors and that much is behavior. Or, yeah, I, I think it's just, it's, I, it's not, I don't think it's a helpful way to think about it. I think what we know is that behavior matters and the behavior is, is influenced by socioeconomic circumstances and, and other forces. You know, I think the, the question around scaling and, and sort of impact, I, I think is interesting because I think it, it, it gets back to that question, I think of, of at what levels um, to engage. And, and, you know, if you think about a, a system, sort of the, um, the higher up or the more fundamental you go in the system, the, the bigger the impact, um, uh, but often the harder to, to, to do something and, and the longer it takes and the more patience is involved. Whenever you're doing stuff downstream, you're always limited to some degree because the forces at higher levels or further upstream are, are constraining how much impact uh, you can make. Um, you know, so then the question is, is what makes sense, I think, for an organization to, to engage in? Um, you know, there's, there's an interesting book by um, uh, Dan Heath uh, of the, the Heath Brothers fame um, uh, called Upstream uh, that came out this year. And, and one of the things he talks about is, is both the challenge of working upstream, it's, it's sort of a book about how, how in the US and, and many parts of the world, we often don't solve problems upstream. Um, you know, you have issues like the wrong pocket problem and you have issues like nobody's truly owns, you know, the outcome or owns the problem. Um, but one of the things that he really gets to is, is the role of leadership um, and the role essentially of leaders of seeing beyond their organization's role and saying, you know, we're a part of a community and we want to have, we want to have a positive impact on that community. And some of it we can do within our own kind of confines. And some of it is about engaging other leaders and, and working collectively to make things happen. And so I think that's sort of this interesting balance of, 
you know, doing, doing very specific on the ground things like, like what we've heard about today. And then, and then is there also an opportunity to spend a little time and a little sort of social capital, you know, to try to engage leaders on working on some of the upstream problems as well that might have longer term uh, and big impact. Great. Uh, Mike Rose, which one of you want to go next? Uh, I'll be real brief just to piggyback on something that caught my attention that Steve said, and that's, you know, in, in my experience, so much of the work that I've done around community-based organizations is super hyper-localized. So while uh, these IT solutions certainly provide the value of being able to aggregate uh, large amounts of data, a lot of the work that I've been involved in has been building um, systems and collaborations and partnerships more from the ground up uh, compared to taking a resource aggregator uh, and, and a lot of information that's been gathered uh, outside of, of a system and dropping it from the top down uh, with some predetermined use values um, that uh, don't always align perfectly with local norms. Uh, traditions and, and values. And therefore, you know, those are the things that you end up encountering as, as sometimes uh, blockers, inhibitors to engagement, et cetera. So uh, just, just a brief comment. And Rose? Um, our biggest barrier to scaling has um, been buy-in. So our primary care clinics were pretty easy to get this integrated in. But, um, you know, we run a lot of very high volume clinics and everyone was like, when do I have the time to do this? Um, so especially in our emergency department, you know, we have one of the busiest emergency departments in the entire country. And getting it into that system, we had to figure out where within the process does this live? Who's going to do the screening? And then more importantly, like, what do you do with the screening results, right? So once we actually find out that these patients have needs, we can't just stop there. So making sure that we have a process in place for actually connecting them to what they need um, became a challenge because it's not, not time intensive. Um, you know, the screener takes a few minutes and then being able to connect them to resources takes another few minutes. And so when you're cruising through hundreds of thousands of visits a year, people start to ask questions of, oh my God, how can I do one more thing? So getting the right people on board and getting everyone's buy-in has in our, at least in our organization, been one of the issues of scaling. Um, you know, fortunately, our platform allows us to scale from an IT perspective very easily. Um, you know, we just give people the right access and, and the right like pieces of the puzzle and all they have to do is input the data. But really for us, it's how do we how do we get more people to do the work? Great. Thank you. Now, John has some questions that he has seen in the chat rooms come up and he's going okay. to ask those now. Yep, so I have one quick one. Um, so Rose and Mike, you could answer this, uh, just about how have community organizations um, and resources responded to this specifically? How are they managing the extra kind of workload and are they able to manage it? Um, so obviously, as we have recognized some of the challenges COVID has tossed at us, we have also you know, had to change the needs have changed a little bit. Um, we are referring more people to specific types of resources. You know, we, we get a lot of housing and a lot of food issues right now. Um, and capacity has become an issue. I think there have been a lot of organizations that have been able to hire up and try to provide more resources. But, um, you know, we are, we're seeing more capacity issues than we had in the past. And, and I would add to Rose, Rose's comments, less on the experience here in Iowa, more in other states um, with, uh, with the platform, is that uh, capacity issues also start to identify gaps in care, which I think is also uh, a good discovery in the process of implement, implementing uh, solutions like this, even when we're not able to find uh, the right place at the right time at the right cost for an end user. Um, as we see more people bump into that wall or fall into that gap, uh, we're able to bring that into the collaborative discussion with our community partners and say, hey, look, we're having a, a, an issue with housing with this particular uh, population or in this particular geography. Uh, that we're serving. Uh, we've got these specific nutrition issues or transportation issues. 
and we can start driving collaboratively towards solutions and way to uh, ways to fill those gaps. So um, capacity, you know, it, it, the problem with capacity certainly existed prior to the IT solutions uh, coming into fashion. Uh, what the IT solutions really do is drive uh, ex expedited commu uh, communication and allow uh, for collaboration if those community partners are able to find that time that Rose spoke of uh, in order to, to do extra work uh, to build relationships, which, uh, which is usually above and beyond. Great. We, have, we do have two questions about the data people are using and sort of combine two questions. Just one, one of them is just why, what's, how widespread is the use of zip codes to capture and record social determinants data? And then where is the CMS with application of zip codes to Medicare populations since their last analysis a year ago? Anyone have any sites on that? And then there's a related, somewhat related question about how, the use of unstructured data in the medical record and how that's being handled. So if you want, you want to put that into a broader data question, if folks have any insights. Um, I know at BMC, we definitely look at all of our screening domains by zip code to see if we can identify certain areas with greater needs and try to engage the community in, in finding new or different resources to help support them. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting way to look at it. You know, we have a very wide catchment area with a very diverse population and the neighborhoods, you know, segmented out a little bit for a different view to see, you know, if this zip code has a higher rate of housing needs, this zip code has a higher rate of food needs. And, you know, the way cities were designed definitely kind of perpetuates that issue. So we, we do look at it by zip code. Okay, great. So we have maybe one final question and I'm, I'm also going to combine to, uh, there's a question about access to child care for young children. And then we have another related question that was about, um, you know, how do we support people who are uh, staying at home, uh, uh, presumably due to the pandemic. And so any thoughts about, you know, the particular conditions of people uh, under stay at home conditions and also juggling child care with jobs and so forth. Um, any insights on that and how, you're, how you've had to respond to those specific needs that the pandemic has created under lockdown? I'll start by just saying in the context of the, the responses that I've been providing uh, so far, the, uh, you know, specifically around folks that are homebound, locked in for whatever reason, or specific needs like childcare, uh, don't seem to be limiting factors to the extent that there are providers out there that can uh, intervene and offer solutions to serve people in their home uh, to, to uh, alleviate uh, the burden of, of child care, uh, especially if that's been compromised by the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, the limiting factor is whether or not you have enough of those providers and you can bring them into partnership and communication to uh, drive to solutions in some of the ways that I mentioned earlier. And how about at the unstructured data piece of that question? How uh, any challenges or, you know, how, how, how's that getting integrated into the referral service services and so forth? That's a great question. So the problem with unstructured data is that we usually can't extract it from the system. So if it doesn't live in a structured field, it makes it incredibly difficult to report out on. Um, we can kind of pull in the area where the documentation happens, but then, you know, unless I can code a search function in Excel, I, I can't really use it to extract pieces that are helpful. Um, you know, we don't have, I don't have access to any natural language processing software or anything of that nature. So um, it's there, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a barrier in terms of what we can actually use within our data sets for sure. Great, thank you. Well, thank you panelists. I think we're up against our um, time, li time limit here. And I wanted to thank all of you for your participation in the audience for their questions. And also to you know, stay tuned to our research on this topic at Showmark because we will be doing more in whether it's a blog post, uh, research briefs and so forth, looking at intersections of AI and social determinants earlier. You're uh, doing quite a bit of writing on uh, 
uh, racial bias and so forth in AI and how it plays out in, in social determinants. And uh, one of the things we were going to be looking at as we go into the new year as a new administration and uh, in the Biden administration, you might have noted that um, Dr. Nunez Smith from Yale has been appointed as an advisor for the uh, health equity uh, COVID, in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic. So there may be lots of interesting things happening out of that as well in the new administration, and we'll be following that very closely. And John, would you like to... Uh, yeah, so thank you for joining us today, and I will be following up with the slides and recording uh, when they're available as discussed earlier, and if you got, if anyone's interested in learning more about this report, uh, in the email that we sent out yesterday to remind people about this webinar, there was a link to learn more about the report or download the preview. Um, also, I have a call out for that in the follow-up emails. And if anybody has any further questions for the I mean for the guests, just feel free to shoot me an email and I will try to connect you. Um, thank you, Stephen, Rose, and Mike for joining us today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Great session. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Entirely our pleasure. If you like what you've watched here today, you can subscribe to the channel for regular updates when we post new content. And if you want to dig deeper into other things that we've already produced, you can watch this video or this one.